We've got another great interview for you guys today. Of course, we don't do any weak sauce interviews here on the Young Turks. Today we're going to have with us Professor Jody David Armour. Wait till you hear some of his theories. I love him. Uh, now his, uh, he's got a book out, Negrophobia and Reasonable Racism. There's another one coming out, Nigger Lover, Social Construction of Niggas in Law, Language and Luck. He's a professor at USC Law. He's been there since 1995. And he's also a Soros Justice Senior Fellow at the Open Societies Institute on Center on Crime, Communities and Culture. Uh, Professor Armour, great to have you here on the Young Turks. Great to be here, Jane. Uh, first, was I allowed to say the names of your books? Absolutely, and I want us to I want us to engage that conversation because Chris Rock, in one of his famous routines, says, "I love black people, but I hate niggers." And one of his definitions of a nigger is any black who's done a crime. So it shows this split in the black community between law-abiding good Negroes and criminal bad Negroes or niggers, and how we need to come to grips with a theory or way of looking at the world that says that 90 percent of young black people in some inner city neighborhoods or in jail on probation on parole at some point in their lives are niggas. Imagine that. How, what would Martin Luther King say today about a comedy routine that distinguished between good Negroes and bad Negroes in that way, or a lot of the black community doing the same thing, distinguishing between good and bad Negroes on that basis? So you think that that, is that a common problem? And, and you, I mean, are you, are you upset at Chris Ryan? You think he, I mean, like, I don't know if you're, like, let me put it this way. You think he shouldn't have done that routine? You think it's, a, it's, it's not helpful to the process? The, the politics of it. I don't mind the word because I think the word can be explosive and powerful and useful in, in, the, in the right hands. Uncle Tom's Cabin and lots of literature and Huckleberry Finn. It can be a powerful word. But when he tries to say, let's morally distinguish between us and them, us being the good law-abiding Negroes, them being the bad criminals. And it just so happens that them bad criminals are mostly poor blacks. And we good Negroes are mostly middle-class blacks because the crime rate between black Black um, and white middle class folks are the same. Most of the crime is coming from blacks who are trapped in poverty. So when he's making those distinctions, he's actually, like Obama too often, put, wagging his fingers not just at black wrongdoers, but at poor black wrongdoers. So that's really interesting because, um, you know, oftentimes you'll hear on TV, well, look, you know, and Bloomberg says this to justify stop and frisk. Uh, most of the people doing the crime are, are, are you know, minorities. So, I, and then of course the people who are inclined in the racist direction will say, "I know it. You see, it was the black guys, right?" Oh yeah. N you, you know what? We have to get this conversation more sophisticated than it's been. When Jesse Jackson says, "Nothing more bothers me at this point in my life than walk down the streets." hear footsteps, start thinking robbery, turn around, see someone white and feel relieved. When Reverend Jesse Jackson says that to an all black congregation in Chicago, we know that racial profiling is not statistically irrational. It's not just crazy people who consider race when they're assessing someone's dangerousness. So we have to get at why it is that blacks disproportionately involve themselves in crime rather than denying those statistics and saying, let's just ignore race. Look, you take a group of people, you disproportionately concentrate them in desperate circumstances, don't be surprised that they disproportionately turn to desperate undertakings like crime. If you have a difference in the crime rate from these poor oppressed people, slavery, then Jim Crow, now mass incarceration, and you're surprised? So now, uh, the fact that, I mean, to dispel the obvious, right, if it was genetic as the racists say, then middle class blacks, upper class blacks would commit crime at a higher rate than middle class whites and, and upper class whites, but they don't. That's it. Yeah, they don't. Yes. So now, then why lower class, and I feel bad even saying lower class, but people who are in, in, in poverty, et cetera, uh, blacks commit crime at a higher rate than, than whites that are in poverty. What, yeah. What's your take on well, that? Well, a lot of that has to do with being trapped in a, in a school system like I'm going to talk about, in neighborhoods like I'm going to talk about where I'm from in View Park, right here in LA, which is kind of a, a middle, upper middle class black neighborhood. The school that it's supposed to serve as Crenshaw High lost its accreditation in 2006. So if you're a black kid who played by all the rules, st studied hard, when you got to your senior year, the, the high school that you were getting your diploma from, that diploma was worth toilet tissue in the admissions process because it was coming from an unaccredited school. So you follow the Horatio Alger script, you play by all the rules, and you're left with a cruel hoax at the end. And blacks can sit back and see enough of that going on and say, what's the rational way to go? It's not just irrational, you know, wicked people who are doing these drug deals, etc. It's people like me who say, if, you, if a program like A Better Chance didn't pick me up out of the inner city, the, I probably would have been dealing drugs. 
So let's talk about whether that's rational or not and, and the choice that are given, but especially in, in regards to drugs. Because I think that that's such an overwhelming force here now in, in society and what leads to crime, et cetera. So if I was born with almost no opportunity and I was in a, in a situation, in a context, where the one opportunity I saw was it was in drugs, that's where the money is, right? And I got no other way to go, or I seem to have no other way to go. Nobody ever told me that I could go to Harvard. Nobody told me that, right? And I've seen so many studies where they say, even the best students at, at and it doesn't matter if it's black or white, at poorer areas, okay, they scored in the top 10% on national tests. So they're, I mean, in poor areas and they've done fantastic. They go to worse, by far worse schools than kids that scored in the top 10% but were from rich areas. And when they ask them why, they say, I didn't know I could go to Harvard. I yeah. didn't know, right? Yeah. So they say they see drugs as an opportunity way to make money, and it seems rational. And look, I, I'm going to interrupt just the, the, the question to tell you a quick story. My, my parents grew up in Kitas, which is a, a a small town in southeastern Turkey. Mm. Right now, there's a, a lot of Syrian refugees there because it's mm. right by the border, mm. right? And my dad didn't do it uh, partly because he's just absolutely scared to death of crime mm. and, <laughs> and didn't want any part of it. My uncle's the same way, right? But so many people that lived in that town, they did cross-border smuggling. Because it was illegal, but it actually didn't make any sense that it was illegal. Because like, why can't I get toothpaste from Syria if it's cheaper in Syria, right? Yes. And so much of that town got success because of cross-border smuggling. And they were viewed as the bad guys. But what was interesting is, later, they made what they were doing perfectly legal. So now the guy, bad guys all of a sudden became perfectly good official businessmen. And then they started buying buildings and hotels, et cetera, and then they're, you know, the bell of the ball. And, and so is Here that, you what, go. Is that what's happening with drugs in this country? Much the same. Prohibition. Think we put it in the Constitution that you couldn't take a sip of that wine spritzer. That's how puritanical we were as a country. And now it's advertised on ESPN. I can't turn on the TV without seeing hard liquor advertisements. So you wonder about the support for these laws sometimes that involve prohibition. And you have my, a person like the former dean of my law school, um, Matt Spitzer, who was sitting down at lunch with me some years back and said, if I inwardly remained exactly who I am, same level of intelligence and native you know, drive and ambition, but I was stuck in these neighborhoods around us, and he was pointing to South Central, which was around UFC, he said, I know what I'd have to do. I'd be selling drugs because I would be so ambitious, I'd want a piece of the American dream, but the legitimate means to that end would be for us, I, I wouldn't have access to, so I would go with what I had access to. And, and in, that, in the case that I talked about with, you know, wh where my parents came from, well, that's what they had access to. How were they going to make money? The guys, everybody in town that was making money was doing cross-border smuggling, right? And, and Russell Simmons was sitting right there just like a, a couple of weeks ago. And when he first started out, he, he said he sold some uh, drugs and some fake cocaine, etc. Why? Because he, he was a businessman. And it turns out he was a great businessman, an entrepreneur, very successful. So is, is drugs the heart of the problem? Like the fact that they're illegal? The, the poverty that makes, them, that makes so many youth turn to drugs and the lack of other opportunities is what the real problem is. And yes, if, I, if I'm a young black male who doesn't have a, 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 a high school diploma that's worth much more than toilet tissue because the school's lost accreditation, like Crenshaw High we just talked about in 2006, and I move into a minimum wage job that I can't even afford anything other than a bus pass and rent on, and I try to walk to a woman who I, who I find attractive and I say, can you meet me with this bus pass maybe downtown for some coffee and she keeps walking away from me and I don't get personal respect because I don't have money and because I'm broke, don't be surprised that somebody's not going to post up in a hallway with crack in their hand for, the, for respect, for self-respect and respect of others and, and trying to keep that dream alive. That's a homo economicus kind of move. That's not somebody who's wicked and irrational. That's somebody who's just kind of doing what an order, like my dean, former dean said, I am a homo, I am a rational utility maximizer that's what I do right now uh, luckily we have a, our first ever African-American president and 
We have an African-American attorney general. So I'm sure that these problems are on their way to being fixed, right? <laughs> you know, they are on their way to being aggravated, unfortunately. I think they were aggravated in this situation because what you had was both a president and an attorney general who went into office with a what I'm going to call a kind of privilege mentality, a mentality that focused on the interest of privileged blacks at the expense of underprivileged blacks. The underprivileged black, when you're talking about city neighborhoods like Watts, South Central, Jungle near me, where 90% of the young black males are at some point are going to wind up in jail on probation or on parole, at some point in life, 90%, then Mr. President, Mr. Attorney General, your hair is on fire. Do something about it. Instead of dealing with their hair being on fire, Holder has actually, for four years, aggravated the problem by fighting decriminalization efforts and by encouraging more enforcement of these draconian laws that now he calls draconian, but he was enforcing them for all those years. And the president himself, whenever he talks to Morehouse or anybody else, even today, he wags his finger self-righteously at a lot of lower class blacks and says, Fathers need to be in the home. Well, he didn't have a father in the home and it didn't hurt him. He's the president of the United States. What has to be in the home is some economic support like he was getting from his grandparents, going to the best school in Honolulu, and then to Columbia, and then to Harvard. Then you don't have to necessarily have a father in the home, you just have to have the support. And so he go, he what, but he makes the noises that the far right wants to hear. You, I used to think he was just throwing a sop to the Fox crew, but I think he actually believes it. I think he's one of those good Negroes versus the bad Negroes. You know, black people, I love black people, but I hate niggas. And, you know, he sees himself as one of the good black people and is falling into that mentality. So that's pretty heavy. And um, what, what would you have him do? If you were president, and that would be, a, that would be an awesome moment. Here's, uh, so what would you do? Here, here's where we would go. We would go where Johnson was starting to go, where King was pushing Johnson in the world before he was assassinated, tragically, because I've been critical of King in some ways, but like you, I love King. I think he represents something important in this country. King was pushing Johnson toward a kind of Marshall plan for the inner city. We need to take this bull by the horn. The reason that I'm talking to you now, Jenk, is because a program called A Better Chance, a government program, a, a Great Society program, reached down into the inner city and brought impoverished youth like me out of inner city Akron because my dad had been sent away to jail, 22 to 55, for possession sale of marijuana. And so it pulled me out of the inner city and sent me to a good school, Lower Marion, from which I was able to go to Harvard. Without that, I would have probably been pushing drugs like most of my friends, most of whom at some point in their lives have wound up in, in prison. So if he would talk massive intervention, come like Johnson came, be a real, a real progressive. Don't be one of these, you know, kind of in the pockets of the corporations pro uh, progressive, and then maybe we'd get somewhere. So let, let's talk a little bit more about that, and then I want to come back to your criticism of Martin Luther King, because that sounds really interesting. Um, so how would you spend the money? Because I think that if, you know, I think that there, and maybe we disagree here, but I think that there's some legitimate criticism of welfare. Yes. That, you know, that if you, I know that when I took unemployment, uh, when I was between jobs, it, you know, I took a little yes. longer to get that job, okay? Yes. And I understand it's human, we're human beings, and we yes. uh, respond to normal stimuli and financial incentives, et cetera. So how would you spend the money to make the inner cities better? Enterprise zones, you know, some these used to be good Republican ideas, Nixon, etc. You create jobs, you put seed money, you give incentives to employers. For example, you you say, employer, you go into these the, to these zones where we have some former inmates and some poor people coming from bad and crumbling schools, but who have desire. And we will, we'll, we'll pay half their salary, we'll pay $8. It'll be cheaper for us to pay $8 of their salary, you'll add another $8 than for us to house them in a prison when we're gonna pay 40 or $50,000 a year, at least 30 to $50,000 a year. And we can create a kind of employ, employed class here that has a stake in the system and we can build from there. And let's do something about the schools and let's have some massive intervention program, a better chance program. Look, they're, they're getting rid of Head Start. You know, programs we know work. You know, a, 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 a better chance, upward bound, head start. Let's reinvest in those programs and stop just giving lip service and, and talking about only the middle class. Everybody's talking about the middle class. The election. And our middle class is important. I'm, impor I'm for But nobody's talking about, as Johnson did back in the day, you know, let's do something about poverty. Appalachian whites, the, the, the elderly, the, the rural poor, and inner city blacks. Why don't we have that conversation more? Do you think that the drug laws are... It, partly or wholly uh, 
uh, to keep blacks down. I mean, do you believe in that Jim Crow, uh, Here, new Jim Crow argument? Uh, uh, there are a couple problems with the Jim Crow argument, although Michelle Alexander's work is first rate, great, great research, great work. Uh, but the, the problem with calling the drug war purely a racist war is too many blacks have co-sponsored that war. When you look at the 1986 Anti-Drug Abuse Act, Charlie Rangel is standing there in the Rose Garden when Reagan is signing the 1986 drug bill end of law, which created the 100 to 1 powder cocaine disparity and mandatory minimums for the first time at the federal level. And, um, and most of the Black Caucus um, co-sponsored that particular bill and, and, and supported it. In the 1988 bill, they, they supported it. Bill Clinton came with a harsh bill. Black supported that. And, and Eric Holder has been laying back and enforcing these draconian laws. So it's been blacks as well as whites who have, who have really incarcerated a, a gener and hobbled a generation of poor black males. Okay, I want to go back to Obama for a second. Um, when you say he's wagging his finger and says, "Okay, you know, you guys, you're doing it wrong. Your dad, you know, you need the dads in the homes, etc." Now, on the other hand, of course, the message of personal responsibility is rational, and, and we all agree with it. So, how do you deliver that message without wagging the finger, without seeming judgmental? Well, you don't. What you focus on when you have your opportunity as the president is you don't sound like Bill O'Reilly. That's Bill O'Reilly's platform. You see him up there. That's the personal responsibility is the shibboleth of the right. You know, it is their main cudgel that they look to bludgeon people with. All right, you don't go down that road. You recognize that social factors. You're proof. Mr. President, you impeach the logic of, of the father needing to be in the home because you're the president of the United Fa States without a father in the home. What you had was material support. You had people who cared about you with resources, who could help you along, and you took advantage. So recognize those external factors, those macro level factors as where the real issue is, not these internal deficiency factors. So to me, when we talk about a Marshall Plan, I think the most important thing in the world for uh, society, not just for poor people, but for everybody, for society to get better overall, to unleash the potential uh, of poor people. Because, I mean, imagine if we had, you know, uh, gave the same opportunities that Bill Gates had to all the poor people in the country. Imagine how much better our economy could be, et cetera. And Bill Gates isn't just a genius, he had access to a computer in high school when almost no one else did. And that was part of the reason that he, uh, you know, formed Microsoft. So, uh, you know, I think we should do a Marshall Plan where we provide opportunity, where we build bridges, right? That's so, you know, again, it's, it's informed by my experience. My dad w was an olive farmer, and, I, and he would have stayed an olive farmer, and I would have been an olive farmer if Turkey, when, back then, did not provide a free education to the people who scored in the top 15% in their, in their exams. And that free education was our bridge, was our bridge out, right? Yes. Now, I feel like so, at this point in politics, Republicans, Democrats, they're not only not recognizing the bridge, sometimes they're burning the bridge after them. Yes. You know? Yes. And, and so, we, Obama's got, President Obama's got about three years left. Do you have any hope that he's going to marshal the forces to say, hey, look, let's build those bridges so, and so that we can talk about personal responsibility in a responsible way, right? And say, okay, look, I'm going to give you the opportunity to exercise personal responsibility, but if your school shuts down and, I, and I'm not giving you a head start and I'm not giving you an education, how could you possibly exercise that personal responsibility, right? Do right. you think there's any hope that Obama's going to do that or, or pretty much you've given up? Well, my concern is all I heard today was a lot of platitudes and bromides and a lot of the same old, same old that he's, that worked maybe the first time and the second time, but Mr. President, we heard you twice the first time. You don't need to keep saying it and not following it up with actions. The kind of actions we need to be talking about is how is it that 50 years after the March for Freedom and jobs, we have more black males incarcerated 50 years later than were enslaved in 1850. So the freedom part is a farce. And the, the disparity between black and white job rates is the same as in 1963, roughly. And the income, the wealth gap has grown in that 50 years. So how can we sit back and celebrate that unless on the only way we're looking at it is from our own standpoint? We made it, I made it as the president. We have an, a black attorney general. The Things have never been better for the black bourgeoisie. And as once we get the black bourgeoisie just thinking success is there when, when we succeed, and if not there, we don't see the failure when there's a mass incarceration of our poor 
young people, when, we, when there's that kind of disconnect, I am very concerned. He's, he's using a lot of that kind of personal responsibility rhetoric, and, he, and he's not following it up with any action like we've been talking about, a kind of Marshall Plan that's going to make a real difference at the grassroots. I'm, I'm afraid, Jane, I'm not optimistic. So, you know, the beginning of your next book is, is the word nigger lover, as you explained. Uh, your uh, dad was black, your mom was white, uh, and you're saying it was what she was called. Yes. It, okay. Yes. So I want to dive into that a little bit, yes. especially in regards to your father who, was, who, who went to prison. Yes. So first, tell me, like, the context in which you grew up and... Yes. And, and all. I was eight years old. The, the door came off the hinges. The police came in, failing sub-officers. I came out of my bedroom. My dad, who was a six-foot-eight, barrel-chested black man, you know, who I thought was a Goliath, was, on the fa was face down on the floor, prostrate with his hands cuffed. Uh, the next time I saw him, he was being sentenced to 22 to 55 years for first-time possession and sale of marijuana. What you had was a police department like Bram Park here in L.A., a corrupt police department who wanted to bring down an uppity black man. He had better command of the Queen's English than many around him. He owned property, and he had the temerity to marry a white woman, an Irish Catholic woman, and have all these semi-mojos like me as children walking down Main Street with her arm in arm, leg in leg. It rankled them. You know, loving Virginia, which, to, which said that it was unconstitutional to um, criminal to, to not le legally recognize, rather, um, interracial marriages, that was only 68, six, and, you know, really 72. Mm -hmm. So, you know, and as Malcolm X said, even though we were in, the, in, in Ohio and not Dixie, anywhere south of the Canadian border is the south you know, in those days. And mm -hmm. so he was, he was sentenced 22 to 55. He would, instead of riding away in prison, he decided to pull the law books down from the warden's stacks and taught himself the law, appealed his own way out of prison, and in five years, it took him five years to get to the Sixth Circuit Court of Appeal, Armour versus Salisbury released him and said, the government cannot do what they did to you the way they did it. And so since then, I've been in this struggle against mass incarceration. That's why all I can think about or care about right now is how we can take human beings, put them in six by eight and nine cells, sometimes for 22 and a half hours a day, um, and then 90 minutes in a pen without windows, and have that go for months and years sometimes, that's solitary that I just described, and there's some other conditions in the general population that aren't all that much better sometimes, how we can do that and, and, and live with ourselves, you know. So that's, that's why that's been my burning issue. So do you think, I mean, especially given what happened to your dad, that the mass incarceration is on purpose? And, and what is that purpose? Yeah, it, the ma un sadly, the ma mass incarceration isn't on purpose because part of the reason for the mass incarceration has to do with blacks who have promoted it. Like I said, Charlie Rangel, the Congressional Black Caucus who voted for the 1986 Anti-Drug Abuse Act. You know, in the 1988 bill, and then the Bill Clinton bill in, 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 in 94, I mean, 80, 80, uh, 86 and 88, and then 94. Um, so what it is, is you, it, it's about class as much as it is about race. It is when you don't have pe people who have Obama's opportunities, who went to the best um, private high school in Honolulu, but instead they went to a crumbling high school called Crenshaw, and they don't have any options, then those people are going to turn to some way of eking out respect, self-respect, not just a living, but since you've defined respect in this culture as having some kind of material well-being, well, they have to get some material well-being too. Not just a minimum wage is going to provide that kind of respect that your culture has defined as the minimum. So, you it, it really is going to take that kind of gestalt shift, you know, a re refocus on the interest of the least among us, which the black middle class has not done. You know, we've looked at, oh, my biggest concern when I went through a better chance was that people would use the example of Jody Armour as proof that the status quo works, that it's racially equal. You know, I could easily, black middle class can easily start saying, don't confuse them with me. You know, mm -hmm. the, only re the only way that the black middle class avoids completely separating itself from the black underclass is profiling, is that they get profiled, they get mistaken for criminals, for black criminals, and they hate that. Um, Ellis Coles wrote a book, Rage of a Privileged Class, about all these middle class blacks who were enraged that they were continuing to be profiled after they'd accomplished all these professional things, had all these accolades. You know, I'm gonna tell you something pretty radical, Jane. I'm, I've written against the black, uh, the black tax, I call it, profiling a lot for years. 
There's a silver lining in the black tax and racial profiling. As long as they don't look good, you don't look good, middle class blacks. Until you do something about the statistics, you're going to continue to get profiled. Until you lift them out of poverty, you're going to continue to get mistaken for them. So there's a tithe that binds you. You should look at the, the, the black tax as a tithe that binds your fate to theirs and keeps you from just floating off by yourself into your, you know, into your, your fancy estates. Professor Armour, I mean, you're, it's a fascinating conversation because you, you're telling me things that I almost never hear. I mean, and certainly never hear on television. You think about it, man, who's representing poor people on television? You know, it's just, and that's part of the problem. That's why there's so, so much disdain of Occupy, right? Yes. Oh, uh, yes. Like, yes. Like, how, like, I could feel the million yes. dollar anchor saying, yes. how dare you? Yes. Jay, this ties back to the march. Martin Luther King, just before that march, had just laid an egg. He had tried to, to, to marshal some, it didn't go anywhere, and people were worried. Was it? The march, people, the grassroots said, we're going to go into Washington, we're going to lay down the streets, we're going to shut it all down. And they came in, the leaders came in. The crowd was running ahead of the leaders. The grassroots was running ahead of the leaders. They had to run to catch up. So, you know, the march was really a grassroots effort. We give a lot of credit to the leaders. By the same token, Occupy Wall Street. You know, that's a grassroots, that's the energy, that's my hope for the future, that kind of energy, not our politicians. We've got to hold their feet to the fire. Clearly, they are, they're not principled. They'll do things for campaign contributions and a lot of other reasons, but the, 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 what's genuine and real is the fire in the grassroots, in those Occupy people, and those people who started that walk, march on Washington before those other figureheads came in. So, you speak positively of Malcolm X saying that it was a farce on Washington. Here we are at the 50th your anniversary of that today, actually. So, wh why, why do you think that he was right in calling it a farce on okay. Washington? Yeah, I, I, I think he was right in calling it a farce on Washington because by its own criteria of success, mm -hmm. namely jobs and freedom, it was a woeful failure. The job Dis the disparity between the unemployment rate between blacks and whites is still what it was in 1963. The wealth gap is growing. So an, 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 it, it's better from a job standpoint for those like Obama and myself and some of the lucky middle class blacks, the black bourgeoisie, but for lots it's not. And then freedom, more blacks incarcerated now than enslaved in 1850. And you're gonna say it, it was successful on, in terms of either of those two criteria. The March's own criteria condemn it in terms of the results that we've gotten to today, unless you're looking at things through the lenses of the black bourgeoisie, like someone who's like Obama or the, some of the rest of us black middle class who've been able to take advantage of the system's, you know, opportunities while the rest have not. So now, of course, people say, but wait a minute, wait a minute. We had separate water fountains. We had, I mean, we still had lynchings in the 1960s and, you know, civil rights uh, workers killed. I mean, it, it was a dire, dire situation. So, Has that oppression at least been lifted, and, and is that at least a, a positive? There's some positive, no doubt. I'm not going to take anything away from that, uh, to, to be sure. But when I think, Jenk, of 90% of young black males in some of these neighborhoods in jail on probation or on parole at some point in their lives, which means their lives are shot. You're hobbled. Nobody wants to hire a felon. Now, I've been out here long enough to see it. Nobody wants to hire someone with a record. And, and, and six by eight cells uh, without windows, 23 and a half hours. For those folks, things are much worse. Actually, things are much worse than before 1963 for them, right? And so when you're coming up with your misery index and you're trying to compare the misery that the black community was suffering pre-1963 and 2013, um, it depends on whose misery you're counting, whose pain and suffering is most important to you. If you discount the pain and suffering of the poor, as this administration has done, and as many have when they say we, it's all, all we care about is the middle class and middle class, then things have never been better. These are the best of times, you know? If you look at it seriously, that pain and suffering, then these are among the worst of times. So Martin Luther King, I mean, he often spoke of poverty. I mean, he yes, spoke, yes. spoke of poverty nonstop. Yes. And, in, and jobs and a decent, yes. you know, uh, living, et cetera. But do you think he could, done, he could have done anything differently? 
yeah, I think Martin could have kept our feet to the fire on the economics, because that's where he was moving. He was moving into you know, labor unions and the need for economic justice. And he saw, think about it, for example, $12 million a month we were spending on this Iraq war, you know, that we went in on, 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 on false pretenses. If you just took $2 billion of that, for eight years we did that, $12 billion a month. If you just took $2 billion of that and for four years dedicated it in a Marshall Plan kind of way to the inner city, Jank, you and I wouldn't be sitting here talking about this right now. We'd yeah. be sitting here celebrating. Yeah. And you know, uh, the reality is income inequality is, is one of the things that drives this entire yes. conversation. Yes. And it's not that President Obama, in my opinion, doesn't care about uh, poor black people. He just, he does the status quo. And the status quo is, look, us politicians, we get paid by the upper class and the corporations and the rich. That's how we get elected. So who do we serve? We serve the people who got us elected. Those are the guys, right? Yes. And so that's why when we have a so-called economic recovery in 2010, literally 93% of the economic benefit of the recovery went to the top 1%, yes. right? In 2011, we just had a story earlier this week. Same thing. Now, the, the numbers, as the upper class numbers were rising, the middle class actually lost earnings in the middle of the recovery, not the recession, in the recovery. So it seems that until we fix the political system and how these politicians get elected in the first place, to me, seems like we can't ever address poor people because they're not incentivized to care about poor people. In the past, poor people's votes at least mattered to some degree. Now their votes don't even matter. So yeah. And, and, and especially the votes of, the, of, of, the, of, of blacks. You know, blacks have stood behind the Democratic Party through thick and thin. We, even when Jimmy Carter, back in that 1980 election against um, Ronald Reagan, when, when much of the middle class, the white middle class, went over to Reagan, the black um, um, voters stayed with the Democrats, stayed with Jimmy Carter, and have stayed with them all the way to the end, till now. That, but at some point, that community, as well as poor folks generally, have to start saying, and people who care about poor folks generally, have to start saying, who's really walking the walk and not just yakking the yak? You know, Obama was good at talking the talk, although, like I said, it sounded a little tired and, re and re like refried beans you know, today, but he's good at talking the talk, but where is the walk uh, for, you know, the most, the most uh, impoverished and the most marginalized? It's just not there. All right, Professor Jody Armour, uh, thank you so much for joining us. Everybody check out the book, uh, Negrophobia and Reasonable Racism. That's the book that's out now and soon coming out, Nigger Lover, Social Construction of Niggas in Law, Language and Luck. Obviously fascinating theories and a guy who deeply cares about these issues and have, has thought them out. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you for having me, Jane.